to actually solve the min cost flow problem. Um, if you remember, the very last thing that we did last, uh, last time was give a pseudo polynomial algorithm for min cost flow. <coughs> Um, we, we came up with an optimality condition um, we, we said that a particular flow is in fact a uh, min cost flow uh, or a min cost circulation if in the residual graph you have no negative cost cycles and so we, uh, from that, immediately uh, evolved a cycle canceling algorithm. Which says, find a negative cost cycle and saturate it by sending flow uh, all the way around it and, and, and saturating some edge. Um, and if you keep on doing that until there are no negative cost cycles, then you will end up with a min cost flow. Uh, the problem is that uh, you could have up to order uh, m, c, u uh, cancellations that you have to do because each cycle cancellation, this is all assuming integer valued costs and capacities, each cycle cancellation is going to gain you at, best, at worst one unit, right? It will decrease the cost by one when you do that cancellation. So you may have to do it MCU times in order to get from an initial most expensive flow down to a final uh, inexpensive flow. And actually finding a single cycle uh, requires MN time using Bellman Ford. So you end up with an M squared NCU uh, time bound for uh, cycle canceling. Okay. Now there are some clever shortest path algorithms. Um, it turns out that using some ideas similar, r related to the ones that you explored in your homework this week, uh, you can actually find shortest paths via a scaling algorithm uh, in m root n log c time. Uh, and so if you plug that in, it improves your uh, time bound to m squared uh, root n log c uh, or cu log c, so slightly better, but uh, still not very good and certainly not polynomial. So today we're going to evolve some polynomial algorithms for min cost flow. But in order to, that, to do that, we have to introduce some new insights, some new ways of understanding the structure and optimality of min cost flows. Um, and what we're going to do well, last time, remember that the sort of the goal of min cost flow was to kind of achieve a globally optimal solution, right? You wanted to send as much stuff as possible from S to T while minimizing the global cost. And so if you think about it, the sort of technique that we developed of looking for cycles and canceling them until we uh, got an optimal solution is sort of a central planning perspective, right? We, we look at the entire graph. And we globally decide what we ought to do. Okay? But this is America. We don't believe in central planning. Right? What do we believe in? Free markets. Free markets. Right? Money. Okay? So we're going to take a free market approach to min cost flow today. And in this case, that will lead to some better algorithms. I will leave it to you, leave it to, you to draw your own conclusions about how that generalizes to politics and society. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a market whose equilibrium is a min cost flow. Okay. And then we're going to understand that equilibrium. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to take my graph. I'm given G and my costs and my S and T. Okay. I am going to um, put an infinite supply of widgets. At S. I'm going to give them away. Okay. 
Then I am going to offer to pay for widgets at t. Okay. You send me a you you get me a widget at t. I will pay your asking price for that widget. Okay. Then I am going to put uh, shippers. On the edges, they can take widgets from the tail of an edge to the head of an edge. And finally, I'm going to establish a market at each vertex, where these shippers can buy and sell widgets. Okay. So, what's going to happen when I do all of this? Well, we're going to get these markets at the different vertices, right? And these are going to produce these these markets are going to arrive at some prices, which we call P of E for widgets at vertex V. Okay. So we're going to have prices at the vertices, and we're going to have these shippers who can buy ver buy widgets at one vertex and sell them at an adjacent vertex. Okay. So what's going to happen? Oh, sorry, but important thing. Um, the costs that we have on the edges are now going to be shot of, thought of as shipping costs for these shippers. Okay. So a shipper can buy widgets, they can sell widgets, and they can ship widgets uh, along an edge. So if we give them this opportunity, what's going to happen? Well, shippers are going to look for an opportunity to buy widgets in one place, ship them along an edge, and sell them somewhere else. Right? Now, what's going to determine a, a, an opportunity for those shippers? Because after all, they want to make money. Yes? OK, so presumably in order to make money, you want to sell for more than you buy. Right? But is that sufficient? You're shaking your head. What else, what, what else do you have to consider? The shipping cost. The shipping cost. So what sort of formula would determine a profitable uh, shipment? How do you decide, based on these prices and shipping costs, whether you should go from V to W, whether you should ship from V to W? Yes? Your profit is just PW minus uh, PV minus the shipping cost? Great. So a shipment on VW yields our, our uh, let's see, how do I want to talk in terms of price? Um, has, uh, I'm going to continue to talk in terms of costs because we talk about edges in terms of costs. So remember, if I, if I negate a cost, I get a profit. Right? So I'm going to refer to a, um, or sorry, let me, put, let me do it this way. Uh, let's say a shipment from V to W is a good idea if the amount I can sell it for at W right, is no less than the amount I have to pay at V plus the cost of shipping from V to W. Okay, that identifies a profitable shipment, or at least one that doesn't lose me money. Okay. So in order to capture this notion of profit, I'm going to define this important concept of a reduced cost. Okay. And I'm hoping that this will uh, jog some memories of what you did in homework this week. Um, I'm going to call CP of VW equal to the original cost of VW plus the price at V minus the price at W, okay. which you can think of as kind of the true cost of 
of the shipment, if you include the purchase and sale. And um, if it's negative, then we have a profitable route. Okay? So if we assume that there are these prices on the vertices and the shippers look around, they're going to see some negative reduced costs somewhere. And they're going to say, ah, opportunity for profit. So what's going to happen at that point? Well, they're going to start shipping widgets, right, from V to W. Is that just going to continue sort of developing, sort of evolving arbitrarily large amounts of shipping from V to W? Or are we, uh, we now want to ask, sort of, when does this achieve equilibrium in some sense? Right? So now we've got these shippers who want to move things from V to W. Can they move an infinite amount of stuff? What's going to stop them? We have capacity constraints, right? So uh, these negative reduced cost art shipments are stopped by capacity constraints. So the shippers will pile in. They will try to buy stuff at V and ship it to W and make money doing that. But as they do it more and more, they will eventually saturate the edge from V to W. Right? Now, what's the next thing that's going to happen equilibrium-wise? If, you if, if you've sort of lost the ability to get widgets to W by, getting, by buying them at V and shipping them along uh, this edge, what's going to happen? Any course 14 majors in the, in the room? Yes? You want to sell some, but the person doesn't want to buy anymore, they can't sell it anymore. Um, good. So V will want to sell some, but there won't be anybody who wants to buy. There'll be a supply, but no demand. Conversely, at W, there will be people who want to buy, but nobody who wants to sell. There'll be demand, but no supply. What happens when there's demand, but no supply? Hmm? Prices go, Prices go up, right? So once you've sort of saturated all the stuff going in, once you've sort of saturated this edge and you can't uh, traverse it anymore, um, then prices at W will rise to reflect the uh, unmet demand. OK, so these are the pieces. Now let me start turning that into some useful uh, math for understanding optimal min cost flows. Um, we're going to ask, where do the prices, wh wh what are sort of equilibrium prices in this market? So we've got these shippers. We've got these prices uh, that can change to reflect the saturation of certain edges that cannot carry any more widgets. Okay. So in particular, I'm going to uh, finish this slide with a definition. Eh, let me start the next slide instead. Um, I'm going to define a price function to be feasible um, uh, for a residual graph, right? Because we're always we're always thinking about the price function and the shipments that emerge from that price function. Uh, for feasibly being feasible for a residual graph, if no uh, residual arc has negative reduced cost. Okay. So, right, this is sort of capturing the equilibrium concept from over there, right? If you have a negative reduced cost arc, it means somebody can't make a profit, we need some shipping will happen, right, um, which will saturate some edge. Um, if the edges get saturated, prices will adjust to reflect the sort of variations in supply and demand um, that, that uh, result. Okay. 
Uh, and so this definition that we've arrived at is actually useful both for, th here, here I talked about it in terms of min cost flow, but we can equally talk about it in, uh, right, a min cost circulation also has a residual graph. And we can also talk about a feasible price function for a residual graph. There, there's no real source of widgets or sink of widgets. There's just a market for widgets everywhere. And you can buy them and send them, send, you, you can buy them and ship them around in a circle if that's going to make you money, right? Um, this is like the, the Works Project Administration in the 1930s, right? You, um, you, 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 you make work um, and, and people get money for it. So this is a, a, a really valuable concept. Um, and there's something really great about these price functions. Um, so here's an important observation. which is that these price functions do not affect costs of cycles. Okay. So whether or not a price function is feasible, you can pick any price function you like, and it does not change uh, the cost of a cycle, that is the cost versus the reduced cost, they're the same. Why is it that when you set up a price function which changes all the costs in this shifted way into reduced costs, why does that not change the price of a cycle? Yeah? Everything cancels, right? Um, so. Uh, you have cancellation, right? If you go V, W, X, and back, uh, then you get a uh, plus C of E, W uh, over here. But you also get a minus C of E, W over here. And they cancel out when you, when you uh, uh, sorry, I put that in the wrong place. You get a minus C of E, W over here. And so when you add up the cost of all the edges, the, the pluses and minuses cancel out. So the cost of every cycle is unchanged by the introduction of a price function. The cost of a path, right, any ST path, changes by uh, P of S minus P of uh, T for the same reason, because you have cancellation everywhere except at the beginning and end of the path. So now, thanks to that observation, we can make the following uh, cool claim. We can say that a flow or circulation, let me say a max flow, because we're doing min cost max flow, is optimal if and only if there exists a feasible price function for it. So again, as we've been doing before, we're not looking at algorithms first. Instead, we're looking at characterizations of optimality, ways of saying this is optimal, ways of proving that this is optimal, or proving that it's not optimal. So price functions turn out to be a very powerful way to prove optimality, which will then yield algorithms. But for now, we're just doing uh, existence type stuff. Okay. So how do we prove this? Well, we have two things to do. First, let's prove that uh, the existence of P implies optimality. If there is a feasible price function, then the residual graph is the residual graph from an optimal min cost flow or min cost circulation. How do we prove that? Well, let's think back. What tools do we have to prove that, a residual, that we have a min, an optimal min cost flow or min cost circulation? Hmm. hmm. Well, let's see. The answer can't be on this board. It can't be on this board. It can't be on this board. I didn't say anything that we used to know on this board. So how do we know that we have an optimal min cost flow? Yes? No negative residual cycles. No negative residual cycles, right? Isn't it so useful to have the answers written on the board to the questions that I'm asking you? Um, okay, 
So, um, so suppose that we have uh, the feasible price function. What does the definition of a feasible price function tell us? Yes? Does the no part has a negative reduced cost? Right. So under this price function, we have no negative reduced cost arcs. Now, if we have no negative reduced cost arcs, what, can we, what useful fact can we conclude from that? Yes? Right. If I don't have any negative reduced cost arcs, then I can't possibly have negative reduced cost cycles. That's great. But if there are no negative reduced cost cycles, what can I conclude from that? Yes? There are no negative cost cycles. Right, because reduced cost is the same cost as original cost in a cycle, right? So we can conclude that there are no negative cost cycles. And what is true, if there are no negative, no negative cost cycles, what can we conclude? Well, I already asked you that, so I won't ask you again. That, is, that implies that our flow is optimal. Okay? So it's interesting, the, the, the price function just kind of shifts costs around in order to make it clear that we don't have any negative cost cycles. Right? It doesn't change the cost of anything, but it makes it easier to check that uh, we are, in fact, optimal. Okay. So that's one direction. Let's think about the second direction. So now we want to prove that if we are optimal, then there exists a price function, a feasible price function. So how might we do that? Yes? Most of those steps are if and only if. Great. Most of the steps that we just did are if and only if steps. So let's just try running the proof backwards from the previous step, right? So optimality, that implies that there are no negative cost cycles, right? But we also know that now, if we pick any price function at all, it's not going to change the costs of the cycles, right? But here's the place where we don't have an if and only if, right? So we know that there are no negative cost cycles. And whatever price function we pick doesn't change that. But we want to pick a price function that ends us up with no negative cost edges. So how can we get from no negative cost cycles to no negative cost edges. So that's a non-trivial question. But you've kind of been working on it for your homework. Yes? What's the price to be the minimum cost path? Minimum cost path between what and what? Uh, between the side, so when I'm starting to go into that. And why, why is that a plausible line of attack? Uh, so if the, uh, if the reduced, if the reduced cost is um, negative, there is this, uh, there is this uh, uh, negative side. Good. So the, 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 sort of the, the insight here is to say, if what we're worried about is negative cycles, then shortest paths must be interesting, right? Because negative cycles are the things that, that kind of break shortest paths. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, we, we can do what you said. We can actually start from an arbitrary vertex. But this creates some technical issues with reachability. Um, I might not be able to reach a given vertex from where I start. 
So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to create a uh, special uh, source vertex S prime with a cost zero edge to every vertex. And now I am going to compute the shortest path from S prime to V for all V. Okay. And finally, I will define, I will set P of V to be equal to that distance from S prime to V. Right. If we think about our free market setup, Right? What am I defining P of V to be? The shipping cost from the source. Right? Yes? Wouldn't everything be zero? Ah, wouldn't everything be zero? That's very puzzling. Right? I've just drawn a length zero edge to every vertex. That means that I can get everywhere at cost zero. Right. If there's negative edges, then I can get places that cost less than zero. Right? It's like super FedEx. It gets there before you send it. <laughs> so yes, all of the prices will be less than or equal to zero. Right? And again, thinking free market, this is reasonable. Um, the, the people are only going to ship to in, on profitable routes, right? They're only going to send to places where they can make money, right? Um, in the worst case, they'll just get stuff directly from S prime, right? But if there's a better route which makes a profit along the way, they'll use it. So what you're basically computing is like the largest profit that you can make on any path involving the edge. That's right. So 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 this minimum cost path is a maximum profit path. Right, because cost is, is just the negative of the profit. Okay. So I've now asserted a price function. Is this feasible? Well, what do I have to do in order to figure out whether it's feasible? Great. So let's look at a residual uh, edge VW. And now we can say that CP, the, the reduced cost of VW is equal to C of VW plus P of V minus P of W. Right? Now, Ah, just to, just to be clear, this was implicit, but I should, I should make it explicit. This is in the residual graph, right? This is not going to work if you compute your distances in the original graph. Okay. So assuming I do this computation in the residual graph, um, what would I like to show? I would like to show that this quantity is greater than or equal to 0, right? And then I would have a uh, feasible price function. So can I show that this quantity is bigger than 0? Well, let me move it around a little bit. Can I show that C of V comma W plus P of V is greater than or equal to P of W? Yeah? Uh, well, I define P of W as a shortest path. Yeah? Um, C of VW plus P of V is the length of the path 
from S to W, S5 to W, it goes through V, so it has to be at least the length of the shortest step. Great. And what do we call that statement? That, that, so you, you are correct. You have given the argument for why P of W must be less than or equal to P of V plus C of VW. But that statement is actually usually given as a theorem or a, a lemma about shortest paths, which is called the triangle inequality, right? Right? This is a characteristic of shortest paths, right? that the shortest path to W has to be no longer than the shortest path to W that goes through V, which is exactly what's being computed over here. Right? And so we're done. Right? The triangle inequality on shortest paths demonstrates that we have uh, the characteristic of a feasible price function. Okay? And so we end up with non-negative prices on every residual arc, which is what we were claiming in the theorem. So we've, we've completed our if and only if uh, argument. Now, I said compute shortest paths. Right? Can I always compute shortest paths? Well. Not always, but if there are no, but, but the, the thing that will keep me from computing shortest paths is having negative cost cycles. Right? So if there are no negative cost cycles, I'll be able to compute shortest paths and I'll get this feasible price function. So we've now proven our if and only if. Okay. Any questions? So this is already sort of a useful thing, right? Because now, right, before we said that if I wanted to prove that I had a optimal, uh, that I had a min cost flow, the way to prove it would be to compute shortest paths and uh, check if I had any negative cost cycles. So the proof involves a non trivial algorithm, right? With price functions, what I can say is that if I want to prove that I have a min cost flow, I just need to provide you, along with the min cost flow, I need to also give you a price function. And if I give you a price function, then all you have to do is check the reduced cost on every edge and, know that it, and, and verify that it is positive or that it is non-negative. So we've, the price function makes it easier to verify that you have a min cost flow. It provides a certificate uh, of the optimality of your solution. But we're going to show that it does more than that. Our next step is to use this concept of a price function in order to get better algorithms for min cost flow. So let's do that. Now again, you should be used to my approach to these problems. I'm not going to start with the general form of the problem. I'm going to start with a simple special case. Uh, and show we can do something for that and then build up on top of it. So the special case I'm going to start with is the case of unit capacity edges. Okay. Just like we did with flows, right? We don't want to worry about, you know, large capacity, strongly polynomial algorithms and such. I'm also going to assume no initial negative cost cycles. So what I'm going to be working on is the min cost flow problem where all I have to do is deliver the flow. Like I'm not also responsible for finding negative cost cycles and canceling them. I just need to ship as much stuff as possible from S to T. Okay. So if I have no negative cost cycles, in this graph, the min cost circulation problem is boring, right? What's the min cost circulation in this graph? The zero yes. circulation. But the min cost flow problem, because I'm required to send a max flow, is still interesting. Okay. Um, and so notice that the flow capacity uh, will be at most m uh, or n in simple graphs. that don't have parallel edges. Okay. So we're going to start from the, the only idea that we've used so far in 
max flow, which is augmenting paths. Okay. So we know that augmenting paths is a nice algorithm when you have unit capacity edges. Okay. When we were doing flow, we looked for any old augmenting path. But now we're looking for min cost flow. So what is the natural procedure for finding good augmenting paths if you want to end up with a min cost flow? Right? I show you two, aug two potential augmenting paths. They both augment. But from the perspective of wanting a min cost flow, what's the better choice? Yeah? If I have a shorter path using the cost as the measurement. Good. So what we're going to think about is min cost augmenting path. So this is the obvious algorithm. And this, this is the kind of algorithms that I like. I like the obvious algorithms. Right? I like it when the algorithm is obvious and simple and the analysis is clever. Right? This is very appealing because you're, you're going to have to implement the algorithm. You never have to implement the analysis. Right? So, uh, okay. so how do we think about min cost augmenting path? Okay. Well, uh, so we're going to repeatedly find and augment a, uh, a min cost path. Okay. Um, and we know how to find these min cost paths. right? We can use Bellman Ford to find the path using the, the shortest path where we use the costs as the lengths of the edges. The key to the analysis is to um, watch the price function. That we just talked about over there. Now, for this analysis, I'm going to look at the price function. I'm not going to use, so over here, why did I define s prime? Why didn't I just compute shortest paths from s? Well, for one thing, this statement is also true for circulations where there is no s. Right? For another, if I am working with a min cost flow problem with an s, I might, s might not be able to reach every vertex. And if s can't reach a vertex, then the shortest path from s is not defined. And so for this problem, I, for, the, for this theorem, I wanted to be able to have a defined distance for every vertex. But in this problem, since I'm only augmenting from s, right, I am going to um, uh, look at the price function, which is distances from s. Okay. And as I do augmentations, I'm going to change the price function. Right? Because I'm going to destroy certain edges. They're going to get saturated. I'm going to create other edges. This is going to change the distance from S to V. But I'm, at each step, going to have a, it is going to be a feasible uh, price function for the vertices that matter. So just to get this out of the way at the beginning, right, if you can't reach V from S, then I don't get a price. But I claim that when we're thinking about flow algorithms, we don't care. So why do I not care about a vertex that I can't reach from S? If I can't reach the vertex from S, then I'll never find a an augmenting path that goes through the vertex. If I never have an augmenting path through the vertex, I'll never be able to reach the vertex. Right? I'll never create edges into that vertex. So if the vertex is not reachable, it's never going to be reachable. I can just delete it. It's not relevant to the problem. Yes? So we're relying on our assumption here that we started with no initial negative cycle. That is correct, right? Because I'm talking about these shortest paths. And we don't know how to compute. They don't exist if there are negative cycles. Right? And this poses the main worry here. Right? So if I create a negative cycle, while I'm doing my augmentations, then everything is going to go to pieces. Right? I, I, I won't be able to continue my analysis. And this is actually the crux of the argument. But let me just finish this. So if we can't reach V from S, um, we can ignore uh, or delete vertex V because it's never going to be used in an augmenting path. Um, but the key claim is that this shortest augmenting path algorithm that we're doing never creates a negative cycle. Okay. 
And we're going to do a proof by induction. And given that, we are going to conclude that we have this uh, price function at each step. OK, so we're going to compute these shortest augmenting paths. We're never going to create a negative cost cycle. I still have to prove that to you. Um, and as a result, at each step, we are going to have a price function. Okay. Now, here's the next interesting thing. Um, given this price function, or, or sorry, well, I, I, I said this before. right? So when you introduce a price function, it doesn't change the cost of cycles at all. Okay. Now, what is the effect on ST paths? That is, candidate augmenting paths. Right? If I introduce a price function, what does it do to the candidate augmenting paths? Right? Reduced costs do nothing to the cost of a cycle, but what do they do to the cost of a path? Yes? They change it by the, an amount equal to the total distance from S to T. Right? But the key is um, they all change by the same amount. So every ST path changes in price by the same amount under the reduced cost. And in particular, that means that the same paths are min cost, whether I think about the original price function or the, uh, res the uh, reduced cost price function. Oh, sorry, the reduced cost length. So original costs or reduced costs, I end up with the same shortest paths from S to T, right? But let's look a little closer at these shortest paths. Okay, so we have S, we have T, okay. and uh, I've got some graph. It had some original uh, prices on the edges. Now, when I go in and compute reduced costs on this graph, okay, what can I say about the reduced cost of an edge? that is on one of these shortest augmenting paths. Okay. So let's say these are all length 1. In the, the, these are the original costs. And this is the shortest path from S to T. What are the reduced costs of these edges? Yeah. Zero. I claim that all the reduced edge costs on these shortest paths are zero. Why is that? Yeah? You want the equality by just looking at the end and adding up, and then the S to actually be or S to be equality because of the path of the end. Yeah, so you can argue it by sort of saying that the, the total shift in price was equal to the distance from S to T. And um, that has to sort of spread out over the edges. But there's a more direct argument I can make. Yeah? If an edge has a positive cost, then you can get a shorter way from S to that edge. And then continue on there. That's correct. So any edge that has positive cost is not on a shortest path. But that's actually exactly what I just asked you to argue. Right? You just gave me the contrapositive, but you still haven't given me the proof. Well, there's a shorter way from S to that edge because if the, if the cost is positive, then that means that the, um, the, the price of, the, uh, of this is not equal to the price of that plus the Exactly. So it goes back over here, right? So 
if I have an inequality here, right, c of e w plus p of v minus p of w is greater than 0, what does that tell me? Well, it tells me the shortest path through v is not the shortest path to w. Right? So if v is actually on the shortest path, then I'm going to have equality here. And so I'm going to end up with a reduced cost of 0. Okay? Or another way of saying that is, at, on shortest paths, the triangle inequality is tight. Okay. So on the shortest path, the triangle inequality is tight. So let's see where we are now. I've taken my graph, which has no negative cost cycles. I have computed shortest paths in that graph and used that to define reduced costs. And under those, to define prices. And from those prices, I get reduced costs. And those reduced costs are such that all of the shortest path edges have length, now have cost zero. So when I saturate a shortest augmenting path, what happens? So this is, this is the crux, right? Our worry in sort of what I sketched out is that we may create negative cost cycles. Right? So actually, let's look ahead to the end. If I never create a negative cost cycle, right, I keep on saturating augmenting paths, and each time I do it, I do not create a negative cost cycle. So eventually, what happens? Right? I augment, I augment, I augment. Right? I never create a negative cost cycle. What, when do I stop? What happens? I, reach a, I, I stop my augmentations when I have a max flow. Now, I have a max flow, and I never created a negative cost cycle. So what can I conclude? I conclude that it's a min cost max flow, because if you have no negative cost cycles and you have a max flow, then you have a min cost max flow. Right? This to begin with. Ah, that was in my initial assumption, right, that I do not have negative cycles. So, I just need to argue this, that when I saturate this augmenting path, I don't create a negative cost cycle. So how could a negative cost cycle be created? In general. Right? Forget about this particular, this particular principle. Right? When I do an augmentation in general, it can create negative cost cycles. How does that happen? Right? First, there wasn't a negative cost cycle, and now there is a negative cost cycle. How, how, how did that happen? Yeah? If you add a residual flow to an edge with a negative cost, you could. Great. So if I create a, right? So the point is that in order to create a negative cost cycle, I have to create an edge. Right? In, in order to make a cycle appear where there wasn't a cycle, I have to create an edge. Right? And that edge has to, have, uh, ha has to contribute to a, uh, a negative cost on a cycle. Right? The edge itself might not be negative cost. Right? I could create an edge that finishes a cycle that is already very negative. Okay. But now let's think about our special case. Can that happen? Okay. So. When I saturate a shortest augmenting path, can I create a negative cost cycle? I claim the answer is no. Okay. What residual edges get created when I saturate this path? Yes? You'll create edges that go backwards along the path you just took. Create residual backward edges. OK, that's a little worrisome. I'm creating some edges. Maybe I'm creating edges, I'm, I'm creating edges that produce a cycle with negative cost. We shouldn't have to talk about shortest path. Right? The whole point of these price functions is to get us to stop worrying about 
paths and just talk about residual costs. Yes? We create edges on them, it goes to zero. Yes. Right? So remember that with this shortest augmenting path, all of its edges had cost zero in the residual graph, in, in, under redu had reduced cost zero. Right? So these all have reduced cost zero. And that's, that's the key. Right? So we had a feasible price function. Right? When we start this augmentation, the first thing we do is use shortest pass to compute a feasible price function. What's the characteristic of the feasible price function? No negative cost arcs. OK, so before we augment, every arc has a non-negative reduced cost. Now we augment and we introduce some arcs that have cost 0. OK, it is still the case that every edge has a non-negative reduced cost. Right? So before the augmentation, we had a feasible price function. So we had non-negative reduced costs. The augmentation only creates cost zero edges, which implies that we still have non-negative reduced costs, which of course implies that our price function is still feasible. But this feasible price function is then a proof that we still have no non-negative cycle, no negative cycles. Which is what we needed to prove. So in summary, we've demonstrated that when you do a shortest augmenting path, it does not create negative cycles in a graph that had that had no negative cycles to begin with. So this actually proves the correctness of shortest augmenting paths. Right? You never create a negative cycle. And after uh, whatever, v, uh, uh, f augmentations, where f is the value of the max flow, uh, you have a max flow. But since you never created any negative cycles, it's a min cost max flow. Okay. So we've proven that shortest augmenting paths is correct. Okay. Now, how long does it take to run? Yes? So you've been sort of using shortest to mean min cost. cheapest. Yes, yes. absolutely. So here, all of our lengths are under this notion, under the, our lengths by the cost function. Okay. So. How, what, now, now that we know that the algorithm is correct, what does it take to implement it? Well, we've described what we have to do, right? We compute shortest paths, and then we augment. We compute shortest paths, and then we augment. Okay, so how long is that going to take? <coughs> Too easy a question? You don't deign to answer? Yeah? I mean, is it just f from m? Uh, so, so what shortest path algorithm shall we use? If, you, if you're saying it's fm, you're? Um, it does first search. Uh, well, we can't use f first search because we have costs, oh. right? So, we, so the sort of unit capacity algorithms are out, right? So what algorithm do we need to use in order to compute shortest paths? Yeah? Uh, What's that? that? that uh, well, that would be good if we had bounded integers, right? Or if you used your scaling algorithm from, from the homework. But let's not go there yet, right? So what we, we really have two choices, right? We've got Dijkstra and we've got Bellman Ford, right? Now, you know, if we think about Bellman Ford, uh, under this analysis, it would take order MNF, right? 
And on the surface, it appears that we have to think about Bellman Ford because I didn't say special case positive edges only. Right? I said special case no negative cost cycles. Right? But there might still be negative edges in this problem that I'm looking at. Right? But not really. Right? Because the whole purpose of what we did here was to uh, make the edges be positive. Right? So by computing a feasible price function, we can, ensure, we can work with reduced costs. Right? And under the reduced costs, we have no negative edges. And therefore, under, for, with reduced costs, we can use Dijkstra's algorithm. Right? Now, if we have negative cost edges to start with, we may need to use Bellman Ford the first time in order to compute the initial reduced costs. But as we proceed, we never create negative cost edges. And so we can use Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest paths in each step. Okay. So actually, um, it's going to be uh, one Bellman Ford uh, uh, computation um, if there are negative edges. And then Dijkstra each time. And so we end up with a running time of order m f uh, for, positive R, for positive graphs or order m n plus m f for graphs with negative weights. Okay. And what's a little bit odd about this is we, you know, in each step, we do actually have to recompute a shortest path. Right? So it, it seems a little strange. We, we had a feasible price function. We did an augmenting path. I just proved to you that the new price function is still feasible. But I still have to do a new shortest path computation. Why do I still have to do a new shortest path computation even though I have feasible prices? This is the last question I'll ask before break. So if you answer it, we can take a break. Yes? You didn't create new edges. Yes. You might have changed the way the path should go. Exactly. So I did create new edges, which might create new shortest paths. And so even though the current set of edges, right, in particular, I may have created some new zero length path. I, when I do the augmentation, I may destroy an existing shortest path, making it appear that the distance from S to T has increased to 1 or has increased above zero. But I may be creating some new residual arcs of length zero that still allow the distance from S to T to be, uh, to be smaller. So I need to recompute shortest paths in order to discover that new shortest path so that I can preserve this fact that all of the, uh, shortest, all of the arcs on the path that I augment have cost zero. Okay. Now you could also take a blocking flow perspective here and say I might as well saturate all of the cost zero paths from S to T. Um, and there's sort of algorithmic content there that we won't have time to cover that leads to some better algorithms. But here at least we have an algorithm that leads you, that, that sort of solves the unit capacity case. And so I, I promised that I wouldn't ask it, that, that would be the last question, but I lied. If I have an algorithm for the unit capacity case and I want to solve the general problem, what should I do? Scaling. scaling. Okay, so take your break and then we'll do scaling. Yes. All right, so let's get back to uh, thinking about stuff. Um, so, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I'm going to try it. We're going to, well, let's just go straight at it. So, let's talk about um, scaling. So, in a sense, we already know how to do scaling. I don't need to tell you, right? Um, we are going to uh, scale in our capacity bits one at a time, right? So, for general, uh, general capacities. We are going to um, scale the bits in uh, one at a time. Right. So can somebody sort of play, uh, sort of repeat the argument for me? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Good. So yes. Thank you for reminding me. Somebody else asked me about this. So in the first part of this class, when we were studying data structures, I cared a lot about logs, right? Was it log n or log squared n or log log n 
or log n over log log n, and so forth, right? Now, we're talking about polynomial time algorithms, right? Exactly where the logs are is not such a big deal. So of course you are right that Dijkstra's algorithm is uh, in order m log n or m plus n log n algorithm. So let me introduce you to another bit of notation that I like to use. Okay. <laughs> this means order up to some log factors that I don't want to talk to you about. Okay, so you can think of it as super asymptotics, where you don't only ignore constant factors, but you also ignore logarithmic factors. So we can, because it lets us, con it lets us avoid writing big messy formulas and concentrate on the part that's important. Okay. So, somebody tell me the story about how we're going to use this algorithm to uh, solve general capacities by scaling. Yes? Uh, you solve it on the most significant bit. OK. And then you uh, compute the reduced cost. You compute the prices. OK, so we're going to solve. So actually, let's start. It's always nice to start with a really simple base case, right? So what's the right, what's the right base case, the, the first thing we solve? <laughs> so we have no bits at all, right? We don't solve it on the most significant bit. We solve it on no bits at all. Right, so uh, all bits out, okay? And so now you just need to tell me how to scale in one bit. And it could be the first bit or the last bit. It doesn't really matter. Does anybody have trouble solving it when all of the bits are missing? No, okay. So now we've got a solution and we need to bring in a new bit. So what happens? What are the steps of the argument? Or at least the steps that we take until we run into a seemingly insoluble problem. So how did we argue this in the case of Maxwell? After you scale in a bit, what do you have to do? And why is it tractable? Yes? You have to update your flow to be better. Good. So you have to update the flow. to a max flow uh, using the new residual capacity, right? How do we do that? How did we do it in the case of max flow? Was last week so long ago? Right, we've just brought in some additional capacity. We need to, that, that means it's possible to send more flow than it was possible to send before, right? So we have a new max flow problem, but the whole point of scaling is to avoid having to solve a general max flow problem, right? So what can we argue? Yeah? Good. So the key observation was that the max flow value increases by less than or equal to m. And that allows us to do what? Yeah? You only need a couple of new augmenting paths to take care of all that flow. Well, I wouldn't say a couple. Can we be more precise? Okay. Right. So m augmenting paths uh, create a max flow. So that was for the max flow case. But now let's think about the min cost flow thing. OK. So we know that we can create a max flow using m augmenting paths. But we want a min cost flow, so what kind of augmenting paths should we use? Shortest augmenting paths, right? So let's just use shortest augmenting paths to consume all of the flow that we created when we, uh, when we brought in some new capacity. On the surface, it appears that we're done, right? So 
what this would say is that one scaling phase uh, takes order m squared time, right? Right? A value, a flow of value m, and each augmentation takes uh, O tilde of m, so you get m squared time. Um, and so that would mean that you find uh, your min cost flow in um, order of m squared log of u time. But I'm saying all of this hypothetically. Okay. Why am I saying it hypothetically? What goes wrong? The, the time bound that I've given is actually correct, but there's a problem we have to address in order to achieve it. Okay. So remember, what were the what were the sort of the aspects of a min cost flow? A min cost flow has to be a max flow, and we're certainly achieving that by doing these augmentations, right? We're we're using up all of the capacity. But the other aspect of min cost flow is that it has to be minimum cost. And I, I claim that if we just do this, we could actually fail on that uh, account, even though we're doing shortest augmenting paths. Yeah? Maybe when you add in the bit, you're creating negative uh, weight cycle. Right. This is the problem, right? So before, when we shifted in bits, all we had to worry about was consuming the capacity that was uh, created by bringing in those bits. But now, maybe often some part of the graph, which is actually not even connected to S, okay, can't reach it from S, right? you, bring in an, you bring in some capacity that creates a negative cost cycle. So after you've done all of your augmentations and things, you. Uh, still have that negative cost cycle sitting around, and so your flow is not minimum cost. Okay. So this is our problem. Scaling capacities may create negative cost cycles. and we need to get rid of them. Okay. Now, getting rid of negative cost cycles, if you think about it, is really a min cost circulation problem. But we already know that's just as hard as min cost flow. So it seems like we've sort of lost control of our problem and are stuck with a new problem that's just as hard as the, uh, as the old problem. Right? Um, so what are we going to do about this? Well. Let's think about those negative edges that are created. So, or, or those negative cycles that are created. Uh, in order to create negative cycles, we have to create <coughs> negative edges, right? If you don't have negative edges, you don't have negative cycles. Right? We've been working with this feasible price function that made all of our edges, right? So at the start of a phase, we, we had a min cost flow. We had a feasible price function. So all of the reduced costs in our residual graph were non-negative. Now we do a scaling phase, and we worry that it creates negative arcs, ne ne negative cycles. In order to create negative cycles, it has to create negative arcs. How can a scaling phase create negative arcs if before the scaling there were no negative arcs. If it can't, then we're done, right? We can leave lecture early. Uh -huh. Yes? Good. So. 
we had no negative arcs before. Okay. And so remember, we're scaling capacities. If we're scaling capacities, um, you know, that, that doesn't change the cost of anything. So all of these arcs that we had, they were non-negative, and they're still non-negative. So the only way for us to create, a non -neg to create a negative arc, which can contribute to a negative cycle, is if the, the new negative arcs had zero capacity before the scaling. Okay. Now, if they had zero capacity before the scaling, what can we say about these negative arcs after the scaling? Yeah? They have unit capacity, right? So this is our entry point to solving the problem, because we don't have a general problem with negative cost arcs all over the place that we can't say anything about. Instead, we have a graph where every arc is positive except for certain unit capacity arcs that are negative. Okay. So we need to get rid of these negative cost unit capacity arcs. All right. Now, we can't do it just by computing a feasible price function, because there may, we may have, in fact, created a cycle of uh, negative cost. Right? But if I draw the capacities on the inside, right, we could have created something like this. Lots of, my, lots of negative costs and uh, unit capacities around a cycle. How are we going to get rid of that? Well. We're going to do it by brute force. We are simply going to saturate every negative cost arc. Okay. Um, actually, this, this example is too easy. No, right. Uh, yeah, so you'll notice that this arc has, uh, uh, I've, I've written it as having zero cost. So what happens, what does it mean I'm going to saturate every negative cost arc? It means I'm going to create a flow of value 1 on this arc, this arc, this arc, this arc, and this arc. Okay. So that means that we're going to have one unit of flow leaving from this part of the cycle. And um, uh, it's going to come in over here. But from this vertex, we're going to have a unit of flow leaving which saturates this arc. From this vertex, we're going to have a unit of flow. So we're going to saturate all of these things at the same time. And over here, we're going to have one unit of flow entering. Okay. So what we've done is created flow out of thin air. Okay? We've said, all right, we don't like negative arcs. Let's put flow on them, and then they will go away, and they won't be negative anymore. Or they, 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 they'll be saturated, and they won't be a problem anymore. So we've done away with the problem of negative arcs, right? Because now, instead of having all of these uh, negative cost arcs, we're going to have residual arcs in the opposite direction, and they're going to have cost positive one. Okay. But we're not really allowed to make up flow out of nowhere, right? Um, now we have, over here, a deficit, right? We have a unit of flow coming out of nothing. And over here, we have an excess. We have a unit of flow coming in that doesn't go anywhere. So what we're going to do is we are going to send the excess back to the deficits using a min cost flow calculation. Okay. So this is a little strange, but it does exactly what we want. So essentially, we've got these negative cost cycles that we want to get rid of. And the way we're going to do it is, if you think back to when we started talking about min cost flow, what did we say? We said a min cost flow is any old max flow combined with a min cost flow, uh, a, a sort of a, a min cost flow back the other way. Right? Sorry, a, a min cost circulation is any old max flow and then a min cost flow back the other way. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to find a max flow that saturates all of our negative cost edges. Then we are going to add in a min cost flow that sends the stuff back to where it came from. Okay. Now, do we know that that min cost flow exists? That, is it possible to send 
the excesses back to the deficits? Yeah? You can always send the flow back as a bad. Right. This problem is feasible because the way the flow got there was that we put it on some edges. So there's a feasible solution that involves taking it off of those edges. Okay? So there exists a feasible solution. And that means that there exists a min cost solution that will send the excesses back to the deficits. How do we find that min cost solution? Well, for that we rely on this, the other fact. What was the capacity of these edges that we saturated? It was one. So how much excess could we have created? Right? We saturated unit capacity edges. So the total excess that needs to be sent back is how much? You notice that here, even though I saturated a whole bunch of edges, I actually only created one unit of excess. Right? But in the worst case, how much excess can I create? Yeah. M, right? I might saturate every edge in such a way that, that all of it turns into excess that has to be sent back. So the total excess is at most M. So I can send it back using the unit capacity shortest augmenting path algorithm that we discussed on the other board. Okay. And since we're sending M units of capacity back, and each unit requires m time to be sent back. It takes a total of O tilde of m squared time to send back, just as I claimed before. And therefore, we indeed get an overall running time of m squared log u. Yes? How do we know that there's a flow that's sent over? Ah, so I will give you a flow that sends everything back. The flow is you remove all the flow that you just put on. Okay? Remember, when we put on, when we, when we create this flow to saturate the negative cost arcs, it creates residual edges that represent removing the flow that we just put on. Right? So removing the flow that we just put on corresponds to sending flow on those new residual edges. And so if I send flow on the new residual edges, I get rid of all of the flow that I just created. Yes? I'm a little confused. Why wouldn't you just end up with the same negative cost cycle? That ah, if, no, because I, why don't I end up with the same negative cost cycle as I started with? That's a good question. Yes? Because I computed a min cost flow, which does not create negative cost cycles. Right? So in fact, what's actually going to happen over here um, is that you're going to end up repricing some things um, as well as uh, pushing flow around. Uh, and, and I mean, it, it, it's worth doing it um, you know, on, on a piece of scratch paper to see what happens. But because you're sending back using a min cost flow, you'll end up with a flow and a feasible price function, which together produce no, uh, show that there are no negative cost cycles. Okay? So that completes. A, so now we have a scaling algorithm for min cost flow, right? M squared log u time. Now it was actually open for quite a while whether you could do min cost flow in a strong, whether there was a strongly polynomial algorithm for min cost flow. And it turns out that there is. Um, it requires some much more significant cleverness than we have applied so far in this class. Um, it, re it relies on recognizing when numbers are small enough that you can treat them as zero. So it, the, the strongly polynomial algorithm is, in fact, a scaling algorithm. But it uses some interesting theorems about the structure of the graph to say that if you have really huge numbers, you can treat them as infinity and ignore them. And if you have really tiny numbers, you can treat them as 0 as igno and ignore them. And therefore, the actual number of scaling phases becomes independent of the values of the numbers. It depends only on the structure of the graph. This was work of Eva Tardosh um, back in the 80s. Um, which has been very, which is very, very, very interesting. And I mean, you, you, you know what you need to in order to read the paper if you like, and I can, I can point you at that. But I won't be covering strongly polynomial min cost flow algorithms in this class. Um, 
On your homework this week, you will give an algorithm that does cost scaling instead of capacity scaling. So now that we have two different sets of numbers, you can imagine scaling over either one. This one, you'll notice, has no dependence on the capacities. So it's strongly in costs. It's strongly polynomial on costs. You're going to give an algorithm which is strongly polynomial on capacities, but has a uh, weekly poly a, a, a polynomial dependence on, on cost. So a reminder that I am holding office hours on Wednesdays, as I announced last time, if anybody wants to come and talk to me about the uh, problem set which has not yet been released. Um, but it will be released uh, as soon as I uh, get back to my office. Okay. Uh, 